so, verse 13, the Lord says to the um, woman, what have you done? She said, well, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now, um, there are people who mistakenly believe that because of sin, because of the fall, that man is cursed. Man is not cursed. The serpent was cursed. Now, it's impossible to, for us to know what level of participation a serpent could have had in the sin. It's a bit of a problem for us to think about the serpents who would be born later bearing the penalty. We'll talk about that in a little while as we talk about our own situation. But the reality is that there was a participation of the serpent in the sin. And the serpent suffered the consequences. Someone asked me during a previous break if I thought the serpent originally had legs. And my answer was yes, I think he did. You see, the mistake we make is when we assume that everything was just alike before the fall as after the fall. It wasn't. It wasn't alike. We live in a fallen world. They live in an unfallen world. How great is that difference? It's as great as the difference between life and death. It's an incalculably great distance and difference. So he turns and he addresses the serpent. And um, we have to believe that God can speak to an animal and make the animal understand what he's saying. And I think we can assume that because man was the Lord of all creatures, that the creatures could assume, could, could understand what the man said to them before the fall. It doesn't do you much good to be Lord of something that can't understand you and that won't obey you. So again, there were capacities which existed before the fall which were lost. And let me just say this, we're going to talk a little bit about the consequences of the fall, but there were mental capacities that were lost. I said a while ago, and I really have no right to say it because I haven't read enough of his work to have this opinion, but I said that I thought that Thomas Aquinas was a better philosopher than a theologian. One of the pro problems with Aquinas, even though there are many wonderful things about Aquinas, one of his problems is that he did not sufficiently appreciate how the, the fall affected man in every way. Aquinas knew that the fall affected our physical natures and that now we can die. Aquinas knew that the fall affected our moral natures and that we always choose sin apart from God's grace. But Aquinas seemed to exempt our intellect from the fall. He didn't sufficiently appreciate the damage that the fall did to our capacity for intellectual understanding. And let me just tell you something. Not only do I know that my mind has fallen, not only do I know that my intellect has fallen, but if it were not true that we're all fought, that all parts of us are fallen to the same level, I would argue that my mind is more fallen. You know why? Because I think of doing worse things than I actually do. So not only is the mind fallen, possibly the mind is actually more fallen. And one of the things that has fallen is our understanding. Who truly understands the Trinity? Who truly understands the exact relationship between God's sovereignty and human responsibility? Who understands it with no mystery left? Who truly understands how Christ can be fully human and fully God at the same time in one person 
Who truly and completely understands that without mystery? Do you know what? It may be that Adam understood it before he fell. I think we can say very definitely that we lost all kinds of capacities through sin, including the capacity to understand ourselves and God and what God says. We have to assume from verse 14 that the animals had capacities before the fall that they don't have now. We have to assume that the serpent walked in a different way then than the serpent walks now. The serpent doesn't walk now, the serpent crawls. We even have to assume that the animals had capacities of understanding because God addressed the animal. Eve addressed the animal. Now, hold your place in Genesis 3 and turn to Romans 8. I want to show you something. Romans 8 verse 23. Paul is talking about what it means to wait on Christ to return. He's talking about the hope that we have when Christ returns. He compares it in verse 21 to, uh, actually in verse um, We begin in verse 18. He talks about the suffering that we live in now. And he talks about the glory which will be revealed. In verse 19, he begins to talk about the creation, all of the creation, as if he's talking about a human being, someone who can be eager, someone who can wait, someone who can hope, someone who can long for something in the future. He says that he talks about the longing of the creation, waiting eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. Then in verse 20, he actually talks about the fall. He says that the creation was subjected to futility. I'm going to talk about futility in a moment. Not of its own will, but because of God's will. He talks about the creation waiting like a prisoner is waiting until that day that he gets out of prison. A prisoner waiting on the day that he'll be freed. It's like creation has been kept in prison because of the fall and because of sin. He compares it in verse 22 to a woman waiting on a child to be born. She's hurting. She feels pain until that child is born. And he says that, that we groan, we're waiting eagerly, all creation is, is waiting eagerly for uh, the redemption of our bodies, for our, our new experience or our, our future experience as children of God. That's what's going to happen in the future. But what happened in the past was all creation was subjected to this futility. Now along with a curse to the serpent, there's also a promise. And the amazing thing is that the promise comes within the context of the curse. Scholars call verse 15, Genesis 3.15 is one of the most important verses in the Bible. It's one of the most important verses in the Bible because it's the first place that Christ is mentioned in His redemptive work. Now, Christ has already been mentioned in His creative work. Remember chapter 1, verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. Who's He talking to? How do the Jews who believe the Old Testament interpret this? They say he was talking to the angels. But did God consult with the angels about creation? And are we made in the image of the angels? And is it the same to be made in God's image as to be made in the image of an angel? Who's he consulting with? He's consulting with his son. 
But that's Christ's creative work. And it's premature in the timeline of Scripture to call Him Christ. It's God the second person. We think of God the first person as God the Creator. We think of God the second person as God the Redeemer. But God the Creator is also active in the work of redemption, just as God the Redeemer is also active in the work of creation. Again, he's addressing the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman. In other words, you will be the enemy of the woman, but not just the woman, but between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. So, we know three things. We know that this has to do with the serpent and the seed of the woman. Now, I told you yesterday, or earlier today, I can't remember when, that there was an intimation, a foreshadowing, a suggestion, a hint of the doctrine of the virgin birth in the book of Genesis. It's in chapter 3, verse 15. And let me tell you why. We don't associate the seed with the woman. We associate the seed with the man. We associate the egg with the woman. But here the Lord speaks of the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman who will be a man. A man who will crush the head of the serpent. But a man who will have his heel bruised by the serpent. Now this is a great and glorious thing, and it's the dawn of grace. Was the woman the portal through which sin came? Yes, she was. But woman is also the portal through which redemption will come. She took in the fruit first. Into her mouth, the fruit which caused us to fall went first, but out of her womb will come the man who will redeem us, the Savior. You see, that's grace. That's glorious, glorious grace. And what the Lord is saying is, you thought you were going to ruin everything through her. Well, let me tell you something. I'm going to ruin you through a woman. And He's going to redeem everything. This is called the Protevangelium, the first gospel, the first promise of the Redeemer. How does He crush the serpent's head? By taking back the power of death from Him on the cross, by dying. How does the serpent crush, uh, bruise the heel of the seed of the woman? When he's nailed to the cross, his feet are nailed, and his heel is bruised. We invite you to participate in the International Bible Teaching and Gospel Sharing Project. Whether these Christian expanded educational opportunities will become available to people around the world depends on all of us. We very much need and appreciate your prayer and financial support. For more information, please visit tvsseminary.com.